In 1989, the original Golden Axe made its way into arcades across the globe. Powered by the Sega System 16 hardware, it was a co-op hack-and-slash beat-em-up that featured large sprites, great music, and screen-filling special effects that were incredibly impressive. It established the franchise as a premier member of Sega's stable of IPs, and was ported to its Japanese Mega Drive console soon thereafter. It was followed by a few sequels at home as well, the last of which was Japan only. But while these sequels on the Mega Drive home platform were being developed and released, Sega had AM1 do a dedicated sequel to Golden Axe in the arcade called The Revenge of Death Adder. It was released in late 1992 and was developed on the Sega System 32 hardware. AM1's aim was to take everything you knew about the first arcade game and crank it up. Better graphics, more animation, more players, more choice, more enemies, and more of everything else you could ask for. They would mainly succeed in this quest, and in this episode we are going to dig a little deeper and go over all the things that made this game a must-play arcade classic. I hope you guys enjoy Arcade Spotlight, Golden Axe The Revenge of Death Adder. Before we jump into some gameplay, let's go over some important features that were added to the sequel here. First, there are both two and four player cabinets available of this game in the wild. The most common tends to be the four player variant in my experience, and if you are messing around with the game in MAME, you can choose which cabinet you want to represent. The feature set of this game also has numerous additions over the original arcade. You get multiple paths that pop up a few times while playing which leads to different stages on your way to the end. You also get a choice of four playable characters here versus the three of the original. None of those original characters are playable, though Gilius Thunderhead does return as the magic wielder when you choose the giant character Goa. The other new guys are Stern, a warrior similar to Axe Battler, Trix, a speedy elf guy that wields a pitchfork, and Dora, a Centaurus. Because this heavily features multiplayer, there are also combo attacks that can wreck single opponents and even boss characters. The introductory level is standard fare for these kinds of games. Straightforward left to right scrolling with a handful of weak enemies to get you used to how to play the game. Much like the first game, the AI is aggressive in its attempts to flank you and take advantage of attacking you on both sides. This can lead to massive loss of life, particularly with the harder enemies later in the game. Here you have a chance to practice up on your placement in battles, your dashing attacks, and your use of rideable beasts to aid you in combat. You will also meet your first boss-like enemy rather quickly, and here you will see how many of these types of enemies will fight back. Beware of the animation frames that make them invincible, and use your dash attacks if life is low. I have found that your magic is better served for large groups of enemies, and don't do a lot of damage on the bigger guys, so save it for more appropriate times. You'll also encounter your first scaling area where the screen scrolls forward into the background. This is a transitional area where you can recover health. Beat down a few mobs and you have the opportunity to release some prisoners, and then a final battle with a large enemy. There is a rideable scorpion here with a charge attack and an electrocution move. Again, be wary of the animations where these guys can't be hit, and be aware of how far you are from these guys because they have the reach advantage in nearly every situation and can even counter grab you out of your combos. Like the previous game, you also have a chance at your campfire to score you some life and magic replenishment. The beginning of the second stage offers up your first chance at an alternate route. You have a choice of continuing forward into the forest or taking a secondary path that moves you through a cave. The forest portion of the level moves you through a small village that is under siege from various enemy types. 
There are some light platforming areas here, and you will encounter a number of mobs that require a good bit of strategy to survive. Use that magic if you have some when the screen is filled with bad guys. It's the best time to take advantage of it. If you chose the cave path, you'll be taken through a darkened area with tribesmen similar to the forest area. Here you have a chance to light your way with torches that can be cut on and off, as well as imprisoned villagers that can provide you with health and magic. There is another forward scrolling scaling portion of the level here, with giant boulders that can hit and damage you. You then finish up this leg of the game with a huge fight with wooden enemies, and a final battle with a group of skeletons. Like the original Golden Axe, these skeletons are capable of massive damage, and can even block and counter your attacks. Keep moving around, and try not to get caught between two of them on each side. Another little thieving goblin dude will come out at your camp, so be sure to get your magic back. Stage 3 opens up in a big field loaded with spear-throwing bad guys and weapon placements. These spear guys have impressive reach, though you can knock the spear out of the air if it's thrown. You run into a mid-boss really quickly, which leads into a city with a bunch more enemies to dispatch. Another mid-boss pops up in one of the forward-scrolling sections, and you again come upon mobs of enemies trying to kill you. Score the rideable scorpion and use your dash attacks frequently. You then begin a segment where you are chasing down the final boss of the level through a pub, barracks, and ultimately a trap that leaves you captured by the enemy. This stretch of the stage is loaded with enemies that need lots of jump attacks, dash attacks, and superior screen placement to survive without losing a ton of lives. The camping segment that would normally be seen is actually your escape now, but you do get a chance to score some magic from one of the little goblins running around. The fourth stage opens up with another choice in paths that you can take. Here you can choose to keep going forward to the pier or go through the west gate. Going forward puts you on a boat, and wouldn't you know it, the skeletons are back to reap untold damage on you. If you choose to use the skeleton-like dragon, be weary of his attack angle. It's really easy to miss enemies right in front of you with his fire attack. As night falls on the sea, your boat is attacked by another, and loads of enemies flood the screen into battle you. If you have magic and the screen is loaded down with eight or more enemies, pop it and weaken up the group. You keep moving throughout the ship until you come upon even more mobs, even more skeletons, and ultimately your boss. This Skeletor-looking asshole can spawn additional mobs to help him out, including more skeletons. He has a major reach advantage over you, so do not stand in front of him for too long. Keep moving, hit when able, and try not to become victim to the skeleton mob's brutal life-taking combos. Should you have taken the West Gate path, you will move through a cemetery and mountain region loaded with tribesmen and skeletons. There are some light platforming segments here, culminating in a stretch of battles before you meet up with a Skeletor-style boss similar to the Pier Path. You are treated to a short cinema of you riding on a dragon as you make your way to Death Adder's castle. Here you will begin your final assault to rid the world of this evil asshole that just refuses to die. Lots of bad guys open up on a battlefield full of weapon placements, rideable beasts, mid-bosses, and large mobs. As you defeat each part of the castle, a cinema shows off your progress by a destroyed portion of the stage. These areas are not easy and feature the largest mobs in the game. Keep on the move, dash attack a lot, and jump kick your way away from bad situations. Use your magic only on the largest groups. 
Once the castle is sufficiently damaged, Death Adder himself will make an appearance to stop your advance. This guy has numerous advantages in this battle. He has the reach, a vicious dash attack, and a shield that will swallow any attempt to use magic. Once he has sustained enough damage, he starts dropping magic attacks that do lots of damage and can hit you almost anywhere on the screen. Jump these attacks the best you can, and keep the combo aggressive and constant. Once he falls, the castle will be destroyed. Like any good villain, it's not over yet. As you reflect on your victory, he climbs upon your dragon mount and must be dealt with yet again. He likes to use the same magic attack here, and in this close quarters area, the second that it takes him to charge this attack can be used to your advantage. Wait for him to dash, then get right in his face and beat the hell out of him. Show him no mercy, keep those combos going, and his life bar will be depleted in no time. As Death Adder prepares his final attack of magic to doom our heroes, the mighty Gilius Thunderhead leaps from the giant's back and plants his axe right between the eyes of his enemy, causing Death Adder to fall from the dragon mount and his final magic attack to consume him. The valiant Gilius is killed as well, and the heroes fly on as the golden axe is in plain view. Golden Axe of the Revenge of Death Adder would never be ported in any way, shape, or form to any of Sega's home systems, or any platforms made by anyone else. One could forgive them for not trying to bring it to the Genesis, giving its cutting-edge 2D graphics and 4-player co-op. But to not see a Sega Saturn version is almost unbelievable, particularly since they still did a 2D Golden Axe on that platform, the fighting game Golden Axe The Duel. It has also never been featured in any of the Sega Ages or Sega Classics releases. Not on the PS2, not on the 3DS, not on the Nintendo Switch. This arcade masterpiece has managed to go nearly 30 years without Sega paying any attention to it at all. This is mind-boggling to me personally, because it's one of their very best games of the genre. The real star is of course the incredible multiplayer mode. Standing beside three other people and playing in this world was nothing short of incredible. It was just long enough and challenging enough to not get old, and the multiple paths assured you wanted to play through it a few times to see everything. The System 32 painted a hell of a visual presentation as well. Huge sprites adorn every single frame of this epic journey, and the specialized scaling abilities of the platform are put to good use. The music is also well done, even if it's a bit tamer than the original. The only negative I can really apply to it is that the first game had a better selection of characters and a better variety in magic. While the magic that is here is often epic, the original had various levels of each magic type with numerous animations and damage levels. Each magic attack in the sequel here is just a one-off animation and you've seen it. Another issue with this game is the rarity of it. Not many arcades had it, so most people didn't actually get to play this until many years later when MAME showed up with support. Fortunately, Arcade 1UP has secured the license to bring home a mini arcade version of it this year. This new cabinet is outfitted with the Golden Axe The Revenge of Death Adder artwork and has a four player deck to boot. This beauty also comes loaded with the original arcade versions of Shinobi, Altered Beast, and Russell War. Hopefully this signifies a willingness by Sega to explore its back catalog a bit more, and we'll see some home console versions of it in some form as well. I'm SegaLordX, thank you guys for watching, and I will catch you next time.